Greetings and welcome. We are in junior English and this morning our objective is to address that classic document that today is called the Gettysburg Address. We should point out that that's not what it was called originally. It was just a speech that President Lincoln was going to give. I have had for a number of years the concern that oftentimes we as junior students take a history class, do a few worksheets, and somehow or another never get around to really understanding the history. Do you understand my point here, Mr. Barr? It's almost as if we don't really get it. And because we don't get it, I'm convinced there's a whole lot of these documents and texts that we look at that make relatively no sense. Let me see if I can kind of prove that to you right now with some simple mathematics. Now I know one or two of you are going to say, dude, we're in a humanities class, we don't need to be doing mathematics, to which I would respond, it's pretty simple math. And yet I think it will be the first way, Oz, to maybe open the door, to start to think about this thing we call the American Civil War. We as a nation fought a war for the right to buy and sell human beings. We call that war the American Civil War. Now, as that old Guns N' Roses song asks, what's so civil about war? We're playing, a ga we're playing a game with the word civil here. Civil here means of or related to the family, the group. It is a war in which a family fights against itself. Okay? And again, the reason for this fight, there are any number of tangential issues, economic in nature and the like, the fundamental reason that we fought this war was because people wanted the right to be able to buy and sell other human beings. The decision was made, no. Interestingly for your notes, that decision took a while. Readings like the one we heard yesterday out of Frederick Douglass began to push the, I'm now ready for this vocab word for you, abolitionist movement. The abolitionists were not all on the same page. For example, there was this argument, let's go down into the south, let's round up all of the slaves, let's put them on boats and send them back to Africa. That's where they came from, let's send them back. Of course, there are all kinds of problems with that idea, not least of which, you can't run plantations without physical manual labor. And if you can't run plantations without physical manual labor, then pretty much everything we're growing in Alabama and in Mississippi and Tennessee and elsewhere, it ain't going to grow. And to that degree, the entire economy of the South just goes away. With that in mind, a war is fought. That war pits family members against family members. It pits neighbors against neighbors. And ultimately, it all ends up on a small area that today we know of as Gettysburg. Now, I'm with you on page 564, and, and Ms. Barnard, as I said to you before, there's a chance here that we read it and we don't get it. Let me give you an example of this. I'm going to blow the minds of some of you. For the first time, I'm going to peel back the lid on the American Civil War, and for the first time, some of you are going to go, holy crap, I never, I never real. I was doing worksheets, but I never understood. Right. Let's take a look at it. Read it with me. Under background. Have your pen ready with your notes. We're about to do a little mathematics, Mr. Mortimer, and you don't need your calculator for that, I don't think. Let's take a look. The Battle of Gettysburg was fought, this is huge, July 1 through three, you want to write that date down, 1863, and you want to write that down. Let's do some real quick mathematics. July 1 through 3, now wait a minute Oz, what's interesting about the 3rd of July? It's the day before the, the 4th of July. We call it Independence Day, guess what, so did they. 
Independence Day, meaning what? We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Secure these rights, governance, institute among men. Remember that one? That was written in what year? Write it down on your paper. 17... What? 70... Six. Now, Ms. Cottrell, I'm not going to ask you to do this without some simple writing mathematics because I won't make you do this off the top of your head. How many years separate 1960 or 1863 from 1776? Do some quick math for yourself and go ahead and write it down there real quickly. Go ahead. Do some quick mathematics just so you kind of know how much time we're talking about. This sometimes really surprises students. What are we talking about? How many years? Anybody want to do some quick math? Mr. Mortimer, you're a math student. How many years are we talking? 87 years. 87. We want to write that down. That's interesting because if you'll think about this for a second, Yesenia, what that means is that if you were a young child in 1776, right? It's possible that you could still be alive by the day of Gettysburg and be 90 to 92, 93 years old. For sure, there would be people alive at Gettysburg who knew people who were alive and knew Jefferson. Think about that, right? A great grandma, for example, might say, oh yeah, I knew, I, I saw him. See, that's how close we are. We are only talking 87 years separating Jefferson from Lincoln. We sometimes have a tendency to forget this. But wait a minute. We're not done. What's the big deal about July? What do you understand about the weather? Intense heat. You want to write it down. And it's almost like the gods curse these poor men that will fight in this battle. It was some of the most wretched heat ever recorded. Intense heat. Wait a minute. You wrote down the dates. July one, two, and three. We're talking about a three-day battle. <clears throat> Got me? Three days. That's all this battle lasted was three days. Okay? Keep reading with me. The victory for Union forces. What's the Union forces? The Northern forces. What's the Southern forces called? Confederacy. The Confederacy. It seceded. Literally, it said, we're no longer a part of America. Ah. They said we're Americans, but we're not part of America. We will create our own nation, and we will call it the Confederacy. They created their own flag, etc., etc. Notice the Union forces marked this as the turning point. You want to write that in your notes. It's so important. It's pivotal. The battle at Gettysburg, July 1, 2, 3 of 1863, is a turning point in the war. From that point on, it was fairly evident after the fact that the Union probably would win this thing, the Northern forces. But the losses on both sides were, that's an interesting word. That's an interesting word, staggering. Now, some of us are going to say, that word doesn't quite cut it when we read what comes next. And some of us are going to say, what was I thinking when I was filling out silly worksheets in a history class? I guess it never occurred to me what this, bad, this war called the Civil War was all about. Let's write down some, uh, some more mathematics, shall we? And now I, I am about to blow your ever-loving mind. Don't worry, you're in good company. Every year I lecture this text, my juniors collectively go, holy crap, I never, really? Let's take a look, just watch this. Before we even get to this speech, I gotta give you a little backstory. Or it ain't gonna mean nothing to you, just like I had to give you the backstory for the Declaration of Independence. Remember, we had to do that stuff on a whiteboard. I'm giving you the same kind of backstory here. So finally, you'll be able to maybe make an observation about it. Watch with me, Miss Barnard. Take a look at this. You're gonna to wanna to write down numbers as we go, by the way. The losses on both sides were staggering. 28,000. You wanna write that number down. Confederate soldiers. Write down 28,000. Go ahead. Trust me, you want to do this, by the way, on your annotations. I, it, it's what I will be looking for when I open your annotations to see whether I'm going to give you points or take away points. I'm looking for this mathematics on your annotations. 28,000 in three days. 28,000 Confederate troops. Twenty. 
3,000, write it down, Union troops, and do some quick mathematics to add the two together. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. That's pretty easy math, isn't it, Mr. Mortimer? It's not hard. Even though I'm on the low side, because I want my mathematics to work easily for you, let's just call it 50,000 people, shall we? I mean, I realize it's a little more, but let's call it, what, 50,000 people. Now, again, as I've pointed out to you, Ms. Barnard, it's sometimes easy to read a line like this and it not mean anything to us. Big deal, 50,000 people died in three days. So I'm going to help you, Beck, get a sense of what I'm talking about. Let's just say, for a point of argument, that the town you live in, Worland, Wyoming, is 5,000 people, which it's roughly close to, 5,000 people. I want you to do some quick mathematics for me. In three days, from July 1 to July 3rd of 1863, how many Warlands died? Ten. 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 Are you hearing this? Ten. Every single person in Warland dead times 10 in three days of a four-year war. Four years, guys. We're only talking about one battle. We're talking about one battle that lasted three days. Ten Warlands gone. See, but some of you still aren't getting it. You're still not thinking. Dude, if I can hit a button right now and every single person in this town was dead. Every single person dead, just like that. I'm only talking about one world. Remember, Gettysburg is 10 of these. If I hit a button and every single person in this town was dead, at the end of three days, what would those bodies start to smell like? I'm only talking about one world. If you were to collect all of those bodies, put them on trucks and take them out into the Badlands to give them one mass burial, I'm only talking about one world and not 10. You're gonna to have to have a pretty good size grave. Would you agree with me? Even if you just stuck them in one hole in the ground. Agree? But I ain't talking about one world and I'm talking about 10 worlds in three days in the middle of July. Oh, man. Now are you ready for this? In an area that's just a little bigger than Worland itself. One of the things that blows people's minds when they visit Gettysburg, and I certainly recommend that at some point you make the journey, is how small the area is. People kind of look around and they go, when it kind of sinks in, the number of people, 50,000 people died in three days. Where were they all? Yeah, the historians tell us that by the second day, the bodies were piled up so high, you couldn't sometimes see over them, the dead bodies. In the middle of July, in the hottest days of that summer, that many people died for what? For what? I mean, how do you, it, it comes to Lincoln, this news. We're told he nearly falls over. Ten Warlands die in three days in one battle of a four-year war. We're in July. Keep reading. It takes them until November to clear the battlefield. Well, I, I, that would make sense, right? First of all, question. If everybody in Worland dies, who's going to bury them if everybody's dead? If you got 10 Worlands dead in three days, the obvious question is, dude, who's burying all these people? And how are you going to bury them? Bury them where? You're going to take them all back to the homes they came from and bury them? No. Where are you going to bury them? 
Remember, you got no tractors to be able to drop some kind of 30 or 40 foot hole in the earth and just dump all them bodies into it. You got nothing like that. The graves are going to be dug with a shovel and hands. Whose hands? Right? This is fought in the Union part of the states or the Confederate part of the states? Right. We're in the North, aren't we? We are, we are very close to Washington, D.C. That's what made Gettysburg so important. We're not very far from the nation's capital when you're in Gettysburg. This is a huge, huge battle and the significance, well, let's just say it, you probably aren't sitting here if that battle goes a different way. That's the truth. That's what turning point in the war means. But I, again, I, I recognize I now have your attention. Some of you filled out worksheets. Now all of a sudden it hits you, crap, who buries 10 Warlands? I mean, let's just think about the logistics of it. After a week, the body starts to decompose in ways we don't even want to get into. Stench, falling apart, etc. By the way, these guys who fought in this battle didn't smell good when the battle started. They weren't all dressed up in beautiful uniforms. Most of them, the uniforms had changed from blue to gray and dirt. Nobody could really make out what the other side even looked like. We know friendly fire. A lot of people killed each other on the same side. We know that. Remember the smoke I was talking about? One of the things about Gettysburg as well is that you've got these kind of declivity. The smoke sits. It doesn't dissipate so quickly. You have lots of guys who die from bullets shot by their same guy, their buddy right next to them. But 10 Orleans in three days. How do you get rid of that many bodies? But I got a more important question to ask. It comes to Lincoln. We got to do some kind of memorial for that many people dead. We're going to do it at Gettysburg. We need you to come and talk. Lincoln's response was, and say what? Sorry? Ten Orleans in three days. What are you going to say? Dude, we get somebody from our community that goes to Afghanistan and gets shot. One guy. And we have a complete community come together over one guy. We're talking this entire time, town times 10 in three days. What do you say? Sorry? Really, I mean, what do you say to the moms? There were parents who lost more than two or three sons in this battle. There were families that lost father and son in this battle. Mom sitting at home waiting to hear about Gettysburg found out daddy and his oldest boy was killed. Several tragic stories of how the father had killed the son and the son the father. Didn't even recognize each other. That kind of story came back from Gettysburg. What do you say? We're told Lincoln, well, if you take a look at the picture of this guy before this war, after this war, he is a changed person physically. It destroyed President Lincoln. Why? Well, we're told he couldn't sleep at night. Why? They kept asking him, sir, have you written the, uh, you written the speech? What do you say? I, I'm getting around. To, what do you say? I mean, really? What, at this point, what are you going to say to explain why 10 Orleans had to die in three days? Oh, uh, by the way, it wasn't like July 4th. Both sides went, Whoa, 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 10 Warland in three days. This is completely asinine. Let's just call this war thing off. We're not going to fight anymore. Nope. In November, when Lincoln makes it down to Gettysburg, they're still fighting battles. They're still fighting battles. In fact, we're only halfway through the war in 83. Dude, are you kidding me? I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. What do you say? How do you defend the number of people dead. Number two, I appreciate your kind attention. Now we're ready to move on. The speeches to be given were not just by Lincoln. In fact, there were a number of speeches given. Are you ready for this? Some cat got up there and, and talked almost for two hours. Of course, you would say about that, well, 10 Orleans in three days probably deserves a few minutes of time, right? So let's let somebody get up there and talk for quite some time. We're told that Lincoln was editing a speech on his way there, bouncing around in that cart, in that carriage, because he was driving, of course, in dirt roads, being pulled by a pony. And it's November, and the snows had already set in in the rains, and it made that ride really bumpy. He's still trying to figure out exactly what it is he's going to say when he gets up there in front of those people. He arises. The fields go silent. What will he say? 
to explain 10 warlands in three days. What kind of language can you invent that can explain that one? To all the mamas, to all the daddies who lost their boys? I mean, what do you say? He spoke for two minutes and sat down. Now that's amazing. He doesn't speak a long time. The speech is a beautifully crafted example of rhetoric. Rhetoric. Persuasive speaking. This speech becomes the greatest speech in America's history. Or one of them. Until just a few years later, another cat decides to give a really famous speech. It's so important he decides to do it on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I have a dream. King speaks those words on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. He understood his history. There was one other guy that had given a pretty powerful speech before. In November of 1863, he had to get up and explain why 10 Orleans had to die in three days. Whoa. The most recent shootings out in Oregon took the lives of three people, and the entire nation is in mourning over that. The Hurricane Sandy took a number of lives, and the entire nation was in terrible mourning over that. We lost several thousand on the day of 9-11, and the entire world was in mourning over that. Ten Warlands in three days of a four-year war. And if right about now you're asking yourself, what have I been doing in history class filling out worksheets? Are you kidding me? Right. That's why we study this stuff. It's time to wake up as an American citizen. That's what you are. This is your legacy. How do you explain 10 Orleans in three days? Dude, what do you say? I don't know. Let's take a look. Maybe it's worth our time. After the fact, this little essay gets published. This proclamation, this declaration, this address, it will be called, gets published. It's read in all the newspapers, and it pretty quickly starts to be recognized as the text. Whoa, this explains it. This is kind of, oh yeah, this is why we're fighting this battle. Oh yeah, this is why we're fighting this war. Let's take a look. He will say it this way. Uh, he'll begin with this, this number we were working with before, right? He won't call it 87. He'll simply, a score is 20 years, right? Four score, he says, and notice, seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We've come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. But this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Now, I want to begin the process of exegesis. And I don't have a lot of time to do this, and I apologize. 
But I think right away, I'm teaching you how to read. And if you don't understand this, then I'll say it again. I'm happy that you're going to know something about Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address and something about the American Civil War. But what I'm really doing is teaching you how to read. Because here in 24 months, you're going to be sitting in a dorm room all by yourself at some college university. And I'm not going to be there to tell you what it means. You're going to have to figure it out on your own. So how do you do it? Well, you begin by reading, and then you go back, and you begin the process of exegeting, interpreting, putting it in your own words, making observations and connections, we call that learning, that will allow you then to be able to remember it after the fact. You'll teach yourself. You won't wait for your instructor to teach it for you, whether it be photosynthesis and its process in a biology class or in a history class, whether it be something about the Declaration or the Gettysburg Address. <coughs> the first thing I want to point out that's interesting for your notes, I think it's interesting, is notice what is not in this speech. I mean, it is a two-minute speech, right? So notice what is not in this speech. Let's say for your notes, one interesting observation. I'm sure with your brilliant mind, you can find a whole lot more interesting things that's not in the speech. But I'll point out one obvious one. Do you notice something interesting about the absence of the mention of the North and the South? Now, that is interesting. Notice, you have no, those scumbag confederates, how dare they do this? Ten Warlands died in three days because those guys down there wanted to secede from the Union. How dare they? Not a word. Not a word. In fact, this address gets published in newspapers of the Confederacy, and mothers take comfort from this because they lost their men and their sons and their husbands too. Lincoln makes no distinction between the North and the South in the middle of the most horrific of wars. He refuses to play that card of us against them. Fascinating. I mean, the easy answer to anyone in the North as to why 10 Orleans had to die in three days is because 23,000 of them belonged to the North. And the only reason they had to die is because the scumbags of the South decided to secede. You can inflame more passion in the North by saying, we need to kill all the rest of them, get all the rest of those Confederates. Not a word of it. Not a mention of it. Notice the tone of this essay, of this speech, is not angry. Well, then what is it? Can you find an adjective that works for you in your annotations? If this is a tone not in anger, it's, there's, there's a lot of introspection here, isn't there? Absolutely right. Well done, Mr. Carn. It is. It's a very introspective speech. Notice where he begins. It's brilliant. I should point out, Lincoln was homeschooled. He never went to many academies as a kid. In fact, he was taught how to read at home by reading just a few books. He didn't have a pair of shoes for much of his youth. That's how poor he was. No kidding. This man who will grow up to become the President of the United States, and yet he is brilliant in his crafting of this speech. I'll just point out a couple of things. Notice the threes of this speech. The trinities, there's a lot of them. We have threes in the speeches. Notice in this speech that Lincoln begins with the past moves to the present, and ends with the future. You'll want to write that in your notes as well. This is crucial to understanding this speech. Notice where he begins. Four score and seven years ago, 87 years ago, he references in the very opening line, what? Put it in your own words. What does he reference right away? He, refer he references the Declaration of Independence. I told you when I gave you that speech on the Declaration of Independence, it's a crucial document to understanding all of American history. Lincoln knew that declaration well. And he said, 87 years ago, our, look what he calls them, forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. That's an interesting word picture. Women give birth. Lincoln said men gave birth. Our fathers, not our mothers. It was an intellectual birth. It was the birth of America, the Declaration of Independence. Notice he says about this America, it was conceived in, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal. It was conceived in liberty and dedicated, by the way, notice how many times the word dedicated gets used in this speech, a lot. To be dedicated to a sport means what? You work at 50%? I don't think so. That's not dedicated. 
dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. He will finish his first little sentence by pointing out, 87 years ago, somebody decided to try a little experiment, an idea that was built around a bigger idea called all men are created equal. We had some discussion about what that means and how is it possible that Jefferson, 87 years earlier, wrote those words and he owned slaves, the very reason we're fighting this war. 87 years later. <sighs> We're not done. Now to the next line. Now, notice how he moves from past to present. Now we are engaged in a great, he will call it a civil war. The term had not been used a lot prior to this usage. And now here it is. Civil war. Look what he calls the war. Stay with me, Braxton. Look what he calls the war. It is a test. Just like the exams I give to you. That's what Lincoln is going to call this war. A test whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Cottrell, did you see what you just read? Look what he just said. We are engaged in a war to test whether the nation can what? I don't get it. So what? Go back and look at it again, Ms. Cottrell. So what? I don't get it. This is the most important thing he says in the entire speech. What is it that he says? This war is a test to decide whether... Whoa. Lincoln thought it was over. Did you see that? Lincoln thought it was over. Lincoln thought what was over, Ms. Cottrell? Lincoln thought what was over? It's the experiment, not the war. Read it again. We are met on this battlefield to test whether that nation or any nation can endure. Lincoln thought it was over. See, we today read... History funny, don't we? Oh, the North won the war, and then we had this thing after the war, and then we had a history, and then later I was born, and now we have Facebook. <laughs> but what we don't understand is that in the middle... Guys, this would make sense. You're still not hearing me. Ten Warlands in three days. It would only make sense that the president of that fiasco would have to imagine this ain't going very well. Dude, if you're killing 10 Warlands in three days, it ain't going very well. Wait a minute. You missed it. What is it that he says at the very last line of his speech? Shall not... What? Perish. Perish. You hearing what I'm saying, Barnard? He didn't know. He didn't know. He couldn't tell whether America was going to last or not. This is the test. This battle is the test. He says we're engaged in it right now. Notice he says we're met on a great battlefield of the war. By the way, notice how his length of sentences is quite remarkable. Put it in your notes. First a long sentence, then a brief sentence, then another long sentence, then a couple of brief sentences. Quite brilliant that he does it this way. That way he doesn't come across as all kind of the same sounding kind of monochromatic. He's able to vary it. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. He says it now. Why are we here? We've come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives. Why did they give their lives? Write it down in your own notes. Why did they give their lives? So that what? Read it. And you put it in your own words. Why did they give their lives? So that what? That nation might live. For America to live, 10 Warlands had to die in three days. Now the question is, if you're a mama who lost your son, is that a good enough answer? No. See, that's a good, is that a good enough answer? That's the answer he gives.